bigger introduction will be done by uh, uh, my friend here, Ashley Tallis. Uh, uh, Ashley, first of all, uh, is uh, uh, a, a prolific writer uh, on India, on uh, special international relations, and on the particular subject of U.S.-India relations, it's hard to think of anybody better than Ashley. Uh, and, and the other two speakers, uh, Ashley will introduce, but uh, I just want to get, it, get in one word, which is that, you know, with the exception of Tom Pickering, uh, we really have the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, earliest ambassador to India who lives, uh, and we have the latest one who has finished his term. Uh, so we got, you know, several decades covered between them. Um, so that's my introduction to the, to the two ambassadors, I think. And Ashley, you take control from there. Wonderful. Thank you, Arvind. It's great to be here back at the Raj Center. And it's a pleasure to be discussing uh, the state of U.S.-India relations, which is what the theme of this conversation uh, this morning is going to be. I want to start by saying that the transformation of this relationship uh, is truly epical uh, in the history of both countries. And the closest parallel that I could come up with as I was thinking about it this morning uh, was really President Nixon's uh, visit to China, which changed the character of US-China relations uh, in very decisive and dramatic ways. In fact, uh, the transformation of US-China relations from the 70s onwards not only had uh, you know, world historical effects, some of which we are still dealing with today, but in many ways they provide a backdrop uh, to the conversation that we will have this morning. Because US-India relations intersect in many ways uh, with the world that we have inherited as a result of uh, President Nixon's uh, momentous decision uh, in, the, in the early 1970s. Uh, the transformation of U.S.-India relations uh, came about a little later. It started in the aftermath of the Cold War, uh, when India began to realize that the bipolar world had disappeared and was looking to build new bridges uh, with the sole surviving superpower, the United States. And from the 90s onwards, we saw India reach out to the United States, first with small beginnings, and then uh, the opening of the floodgates, uh, which occurred in the late Clinton administration and in the two terms of the Bush administration. And that flood has, has not ceased uh, to flow. For all the good things that we will say about uh, US-India relations today, I also want to emphasize that it is a challenging relationship to manage because there are great asymmetries that characterize uh, both the partners. The United States and India have very different histories and they bring very different histories and in intersection as they interact with each other. Uh, it's no great surprise to anyone that the relationship also embodies very significant power differentials. The United States is a superpower. India is a rising power, to be sure, but does not yet measure up uh, to the stature of the United States. And our ambitions, too, are different. The United States has, as part of its national strategy, the desire to protect uh, the post-war order that it has built. And India is looking for ways to accommodate itself in that order, even as it rises. So to explore different dimensions of these issues, uh, I have with me today uh, two incredible interlocutors. Ambassador Frank Wisner to my immediate right, and Ambassador Ken Juster uh, further to my right. Uh, ambassador Wisner was our ambassador in New Delhi from 1994 to 1997. He's had an illustrious diplomatic career, uh, serving in many places beyond India, including the Philippines and Egypt, 
and also served as the Under Secretary in the Department of State and in the Department of Defense. Uh, so he will be able to engage with us today, not just simply on the issues of India narrowly, but the broad expanse uh, of US foreign policy insofar as it, uh, it intersects with India. Ken Juster, too, has had an illustrious career both in government and in the private sector. He was the deputy assistant to the president for international uh, economic affairs uh, at the National Security Council and in the National Economic Council and was the undersecretary of commerce. And in fact, that was the first time that I intersected with Ken because Ken was involved in what is now almost a forgotten agreement, uh, the next steps in strategic partnership, which laid the foundations for the civil nuclear agreement, uh, which followed a few years later. So we have two individuals with us today who can really cover the waterfront, as it were. And so I want to start uh, by asking Ambassador Visner a very broad question. Uh, Ambassador Visner, you watched the relationship from the earliest green shoots in the 90s, when you had to deal with a very brilliant and wily Prime Minister, Narasimha Rao, all the way to the relationship as it is today. How would you characterize the state of US-India relations from the time you were in Delhi uh, at, to the present? Uh, <clears throat> Fine. Let me uh, do a couple of things, but first, to say, Ashley, what an utter pleasure it is to share a stage with you today, and Ken, an old friend, long-standing, uh, to be with both of you. Okay. Um, to those who may not know, I first met Ashley in New Delhi. Uh, Ashley, you came to raise our sights, if you will, to the strategic dynamic of a potential U.S.-India relationship, and you were enormously effective in doing so. To a point that today, I freely admit to all of you, I believe you have in front of you today the finest strategic mind and analyst of not only Asia-Pacific matters, but particularly of the U.S.-India space. Ashley, uh, I have huge respect for you. Yep. and so. I should really be asking you the question you asked me, but you did, you were nice enough, and <clears throat> Arvin was as well, to introduce me with the exception of Tom Pickering as the oldest serving American ambassador in <laughs> India. I think all of us take some heart, Ken, I know you would, that this week finally we have a new ambassador, <clears throat> Eric Garcetti. I think he's in Los Angeles today and I believe early next week he yes. departs for yes. India after something of a delay. Uh, something but we all, I'm sure, join in wishing him well, a man of great talent. Um, actually, you ask about the trajectory and the state of the U.S.-India relationship. I want to answer that very briefly and come back to it during the course of our discussion. But I also want to carry your question a step further and look at one issue that preoccupies me <clears throat> that troubles my horizon as to the direction and the sustainability of the U.S.-India relationship, um, <clears throat> a subject that I believe it's vital for this conference to get its mind around and our own discussion today on this stage. But let me open with a contention that is indisputable. You made it yourself, Ashley, and that is that the U.S.-India relationship today is stronger, more broadly based than at any time in its modern history. And when I say modern history, the history of the Indian Republic. Um, it is strong principally because of a common strategic necessity that is dealing with the rising power of the People's Republic of China, a fact that is on our screen and on India's screen as primary challenges. 
The relationship, of course, does not stop there. It goes well beyond with a huge community of Americans of Indian origin who are throughout this country occupying positions of great influence in academe, in our Congress, in our hospital system, <laughs> among our best writers, uh, among our top corporate executives, not to mention the sheer numbers involved. Uh, it's a very powerful force that has only grown over the years and whose trajectory knows no visible end. Um, but that's not all. Uh, the economic relationship has been fundamentally transformed over the past several decades to a multi-billion dollar uh, economy. Um, there is much more to grow and much more to do, and there are issues to be joined. Um, so we have a common political, strategic, economic, uh, and I social perspective, and we have a common interest in some great values in the world, which are much besieged at the moment, both contested in India, the mainsprings of principle of modern democracies on the world stage at large and most definitely looking at the oncoming election of 2024 in our own democracy. So uh, much that is part of this relationship that makes it so very special. But while I'm prepared this morning to admit to you as Ashley has opened that the relationship is stronger and better founded today than it has ever been and shows every prospect of continuing to grow, I am at the same time troubled by a point, Ashley, you made when you referred to asymmetries. And I'm going to take that point one step further, from asymmetries to a fundamental gap in strategic perceptions, to a fundamental gap in the way India's leadership, not just this round of leaders, looks at India's future and the way Americans, and I mean the American body politic and not just a current administration, looks at America's place in the world and therefore the underpinnings of the relationship on which the US and India are trying to proceed. I believe there is a disconnect. I believe America's conception of relationships is part and parcel of its view that America must reestablish itself as the recent national security statement made here as a power that cannot be challenged on the world stage. Uh, an overstatement of America's ambitions of unparalleled danger. For we have no capacity to achieve such a grandiloquent objective. And on the other hand, we have India, which fought hard for its independence and jealously stands by its tenets of independence and believes deeply in India's need to preserve strategic autonomy. So we have two major conceptions. Americans look at those with whom we treat as allies, as people who agree with us and follow in our wake and accept the fact of the preeminence of American power and India, which fundamentally pursues a different vision, a vision of strategic autonomy in which India will pursue India's national interests to India's benefit. And India will guard that place jealously, whether it's oil imports from Russia or <clears throat> different relationships with Iran uh, areas in which we in India may actually not see eye to eye and have to learn to live with one another. So I believe at the heart of the challenge you all face today as members of this group is how we manage that challenge. And at the heart of the challenge, I need not remind anyone today is China. Uh, China. China with whom 
if we do not get our American relationship sorted out, presents a massive threat to global security. If we in China do not develop what is popularly called guardrails these days and figure out how to manage strategic competition between our two powers, the world is in trouble. And I believe India understands that. And India sees the challenge of broadening the basis of international cooperation. It does not see a unilateral approach to China as our Congress seems to see it today of belittling China, containing it, and bludgeoning it. Um, here is a fresh challenge for the American mind to take into account India's needs for security and the world's needs for a balance in the U.S.-China relationship, which in my judgment comes around to a longstanding concept in international affairs, the balance of power, something I believe Indians, not only uh, Cardinal Richelieu respect, the need for states to respect each other's sovereignty, territorial integrity, internal systems of governance, and only combine when a power threatens that balance. So on that conceptual basis, I can see a new area to forge U.S.-Indian strategic cooperation. But I believe when I think about the greatest single challenge before the American and Indian minds today is how to take our quite different conceptions and put them together to create a balance, a balance, not only in the Asia Pacific area, but it's a much broader, broader engagement. So Ashley, forgive me, Ken, forgive me for going on so long, but I wanted to put a challenge on the table at the outset. And we can talk about all of the areas that we need to work with India in, to strengthen India, to be a strong player in maintaining the global balance in the economy and security, in social and intellectual interactions, uh, down to global responsibilities like infrastructure development and the management of finances coming out of global finances coming out of the COVID period. Sure. These are huge areas of potential cooperation. But the heart, Ashley, and the point I want to make to all of you, the heart of it lies a strategic issue that we have to address and understand if the broadest interests of the global community are to be protected. Sorry, Ashley, back to you. No, that was, that was fantastic. That was fantastic. I'm, I'm glad you put on the table what is often implied and addressed in indirect ways. I want to pick up on that theme and actually ask Ambassador, Ambassador Juster a follow-on question. Ambassador Visner emphasized the tension between the U.S. desire to protect primacy, completely understandable given that we have a somewhat proprietary attitude to the world that we built after 1945, and the Indian desire to protect autonomy. The quest, and the Indian desire to protect autonomy, its own autonomy. Is there an advantage to India that derives from the maintenance of U.S. primacy especially given that a world in which the U.S. remains preeminent provides the best insurance to India in the context of its own rivalries with China. In other words, while the question about primacy is obviously uncomfortable for many countries in the international system, are there some benefits to third parties from the maintenance of this primacy in the context of their own security competitions? And how do you see India, in a sense, managing this tension? Okay, well, first of all, it's, as Frank said, a great pleasure to be here with Ashley, who I first met in Delhi also in 2001 when we began something called the High Technology Cooperation Group that has now been reincarnated as the U.S.-India Strategic Trade Dialogue uh, last week or two weeks ago in India with the announcement by 
Minister Jay Shankar and Secretary Gina Raimondo. Uh, and Frank is someone who I worked with in the George H.W. Bush State Department when he was Under Secretary for Security Affairs, and I regard as a mentor. And having heard his comprehensive uh, explanation of the state of U.S.-India relations, I still am in awe of Frank and learn from him tremendously. I hope people took notes because that was an incredible overview of the relationship in every, uh, every respect. Uh, and that strategic challenge is really what is you're seeing evolve in the relationship. And I think in some respects the quad, which is this formation of three allies, the United States, Australia, and Japan, and one strategic partner, India, is trying to cope with. How can they help create a structure or an architecture for the region that is not designed necessarily to contain China, but to prevent an expansionist or hegemonic China in the region and hopefully build a series of norms and principles and rules that will allow all countries uh, to prosper. I'm beginning with that to then get to your question, Ashley. Uh, what you see in the Quad is how countries such as India can maintain its sense of autonomy and yet also work constructively with three allies that uh, more easily can agree on certain defense and other measures. And uh, it's really a region, the Indo-Pacific, in flux uh, and great change caused by the rise of China, the aftermath of COVID, on the periphery, the decline of Russia, uh, and the rise of India. Uh, and I do think that India does, well, it wants a multipolar world. And for example, it sees Russia as a pole in that world. The United States sees Russia as a revisionist country that it wants to seek to prevent from rising through its web of interrelationships in Europe and in Asia. But for India, I don't think because it believes in a multipolar world, it has to feel that every poll is equal and that the United States has to lose some of its qualities because I think it very much benefits and appreciates some of the primacy that Ashley referred to in several ways. First, when the U.S.-India relationship began to really accelerate, China was something that the relationship was hedging against, but it was not as much of a strategic challenge head on. Uh, and that relationship has, uh, as Frank was saying, expanded and deepened across virtually every issue out there. Uh, but in the last few years, the strategic clarity of the challenge by China has sharpened the cooperation in the defense area and really helped revitalize the Quad, which is an organization that had first been, well, a grouping that had first been formed in 2004 in response to the tsunami in Asia. It then formally uh, came together as the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue in 2007, really at the impetus of uh, Japanese Prime Minister Abe. Uh, it was disbanded in 2008 when critics claimed it was an Asian NATO and the Chinese were protesting its existence. Uh, and then the Japanese and the United States worked to get it revitalized in 2017. And while I was ambassador, we began meetings at the working level and in 2019 and 2020 had meetings at the ministerial level, but there was still by India's uh, uh, senses a reservation about how far forward leaning the Quad should be, what issues we should work on. Uh, we couldn't even agree on a joint statement in 2020. But then when the Chinese uh, turned on the northern border and created problems, and there was in fact the first casualties in June of 2020 in 45 years on the Chinese-Indian border, and it's an undefined border, which is a part of the challenge, the Indians began to accelerate their involvement in the Quad and the agenda broadened. And while it still will not address security issues for 
concern of antagonizing the Chinese. And, and as Ashley was saying, India lives in a very different geographical position than the United States and has a different historical perspective. Uh, and you'll notice, by the way, that the quadrilateral security dialogue no longer is the quadrilateral security dialogue, it's just the quad. If you look at any public statement since 2019, 20, it just refers to the quad so as not to have that security component. And yet, there's greater coordination among these four countries. I was in India two weeks ago. There was a quad ministerial, and the four quad ministers then had a, uh, a meeting with what was called the Ricina Dialogue. The body language, the level of comfort, which not only exists in each of the bilateral relationships, including the U.S.-India relationship, but amongst the four of them was extraordinary. And they now announced a maritime security working group. And so I'm giving all this background because I do think that India now sees the primacy of the United States as a way to uh, make sure that it can hopefully keep China in check militarily, that it can get greater access to technology and an acceleration of its own internal uh, economic development, uh, defense co-production. Uh, and so it, I don't think India views that as a negative. I still think it wants, as Ashley and Frank had indicated, a bipolar and balanced, more balanced world. But it sees the United States as uh, a fundamental strategic partner. It has about 29 or 30 strategic partners, including China, Russia, Iran, and others. Uh, but the U.S. is, uh, I think, perhaps first among equals and not something that the Indians reject. But it's this whole management of the strategic challenge that Frank uh, mentioned that's going to be what we grapple with uh, in the years ahead. And how do we do that? Uh, India does not want to see the United States get in a conflict with China. It's the last thing they want. But they also don't want the Chinese to aggressively start to uh, take territory from India on the northern border in Arunachal Pradesh and the like. And how we manage this asymmetry is, in a sense, playing itself out in the quad. It's playing itself out in the reactions to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And uh, as I said to uh, Ashley earlier, a few years ago, India was concerned that China and the United States might form a G2 and divide the world into spheres of influence. Now there may be a little concern that they get dragged into a conflict with China, which they don't want either. Uh, and so this is the interesting dynamic, but it's taking place in the context of an increasingly strong U.S.-Indian relationship in terms of the substance we cover, in terms of the tone, in terms of the glue provided by Indian Americans, and increasing numbers of Americans that live in India who are children of Indian families when they were in the United States working or studying at school. And this is uh, what always makes it a challenging uh, and interesting and complicated relationship. Day to day, uh, it's not always that easy. But if you look, step back and look at the progress over the last 20 some odd years, it's extraordinary that we coordinate and work together in the ways that we do. I, that's a very helpful intervention, Ken. I wanted to come back to a couple of themes that Ambassador Wisner raised and get your response to that as well. So it seems to me that India can live with an American primacy rightly utilized because it sees some forms of primacy as being helpful to India's own interests, both with respect to India's security as well as as a leveraging device for India to get to the high tables of global governance. And we've been very supportive of India on that count in so many ways over the last 30 years. But it seems to me that India and the United States have a parallel problem with respect to China, which is even though we see China as the most pressing strategic challenge to our interests, we have deep economic ties with China that we can neither wish away nor pretend don't exist. And for all the talk of decoupling and so on and so forth, I would hazard a bet that we will never get to the kind of decoupling 
that gives us the freedom to do what we want with China as we wish. And it seems to me that India is in a parallel position where even though the depth of the economic relationship doesn't match that of the United States with China, China is still a very important trading partner for India. India cannot walk away from it. So how, what lessons does India take away from the US-China relationship? I mean, how do you see the pursuit of guardrails in the Indian context? And uh, Ambassador Vizna, if you could talk about the whole issue of guardrails in the US context, because I think that's equally important for us, and then it would be useful to sort of share notes on, on how the two countries approach this. But Ken, if you could start with India, how does India manage this? Well, uh, a number of points in response to your question. First, India now looks at the US-China economic relationship as something that the US was responsible for helping China's economic growth, because in the early 2000s, we uh, helped admit China to the World Trade Organization and really did a lot of U.S. investment in India, transferred a lot of technology. And so on one level, the Indians say, you helped China become what it has. We'd like to help India in a similar way by investing in our country, by loosening any uh, restrictions on uh, sending sensitive U.S. technology to India, by doing co-production and by helping grow the Indian economy. So that's one lesson. Uh, secondly, uh, as you said correctly so, unlike in the Cold War where the Soviet Union had virtually no interaction with the West and vice versa, most of our economies are deeply integrated with China, uh, whether that was by design or by uh, simply what unfolded. That is a reality. And even though India, in the aftermath of uh, events in 2020, wanted to limit Chinese economic interaction, it had a record level of trade with China that year. And so it's not going to be able to have, as Ashley said, a decoupling, even though the Chinese are also looking at it. What I think countries are focusing on more now, and still will be challenging, is at least in what they regard as critical dependencies or critical technologies to try to first bring some of that onshore or to at least be working with trusted partners on that and to see if there could be a bit of a separation from China. And the Chinese are saying the same thing, but that won't be easy either because there are certain areas such as rare earth minerals and whatever where the Chinese just have you know, uh, critical supplies of that. So that will be a, a challenge. Uh, but the other area where I think India and the United States have fallen short is that for many countries in the region, uh, especially the smaller ones, the economic arena is the real playing field and China is fully integrated uh, in terms of bilateral trade, in terms of having been a leader in signing and being part of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, and it's now applied for the High Standards Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership, whereas India and the United States have both withdrawn from these. India had been part of the RCEP negotiations for seven years and pulled out uh, in November of 2019 before the signing, in part because it was concerned that China was going to dominate uh, the economic, uh, regional economic relationship. And the United States had been a signatory of the trans pacific Partnership Agreement, but I think in a mistake, and strategic mistake, pulled out abruptly at the beginning of the Trump administration. We're now trying to come up with some sort of economic engagement. The United States has launched something called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, but without being able to put market access issues on the table, which is the key to really getting a trade agreement, but countries are focusing on what they call resilient supply chains. How do we create those on critical and emerging technologies? And so this is going to be a complicated process. And uh, ultimately, one of the reasons why countries engage economically is to reduce political disagreements and uh, to give 
greater ballast to the relationship, and hopefully the economic interactions that the United States, India, and others have with China, and China has with these countries, will create a guardrail and will make all of them realize that the devastating implications of a conflict for the world economy aren't worth it, and uh, it restrains them. No problem with the assertion of American power. In fact, I believe it's absolutely essential to the assurance of our place at the global table. I have no problem with India finding that an empowerful lever. But the idea that seems to undergird much of America's strategic dialogue, that somehow we're going to reestablish American leadership on the global stage, is completely misplaced and risks getting us into a great deal of trouble, not just to mention a point of division with India over time. That's the first sort of broad comment I wanted to make. The second is how then do you conceptualize an order in which American strength, Indian talent, Indian, India's rising strength, how do these all come together? How does the quad play in, as Ken so articulately described it? Uh, to me, the quad is a terrific instrument of building a number of walls of a system of balance, building a number of points in a system of balance. AUKUS, the nuclear submarine agreement, is another. Uh, the assertion of Japanese uh, defense reconstruction, the intensification of the U.S.-Philippine relationship uh, with the readmission of United States forces to a number of bases in the Philippines. All of these should be a signal to China that we have the capacity to balance. We're developing balance. We're developing alliance systems, not alliances, in the old-fashioned terms, but systems of cooperation that provide balance. And the aim, and where I think we in India need to find common intellectual ground, is achieving a balance of power. So that China sees, not that we are ganging up to make war, but that we are ganging up to preserve the peace. So that's my second contention. My third, comes very directly to what both of you are arguing for, and that is how do we in India pursue that objective practically? I believe very definitely that a stronger India is in our interest and is in the interest of this balance that I refer to. And that means full-throated defense cooperation, technological is Ken has pointed out, uh, economic. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done on both sides. Ken has brilliantly pointed out the lack of clarity on the Indian and American sides on the trade front. You can't build a trade alternative to China with closed doors, intellectual and physical, on both sides. All of these issues have to be addressed. But I particularly like to hint that I think you both uh, can, you in particular, laid out, and that is how do you identify and respond to the needs of the community around the world and particularly the Asian community? And if I look at one issue that is bedeviling the world at large, and that's infrastructure development. The Chinese seized on this. They've done it brilliantly. But who's to say that the Quad, Japan, the United States, India, could not have an infrastructure development initiative as a clear goal to be able to offer equivalent or better terms and be able to offer development models that are more respectful of human rights, labor rights, environmental protections, and our Chinese colleagues put on the table, and still leave space for China to operate and compete and improve its own product. 
Uh, it's that sort of world that I'm trying to drive at. Not one in which we emphasize our opposition to China, but in which we recognize that we cannot escape the imperative of sharing responsibility with China for outcomes that are important to us. How else are we going to deal with climate change without China? India and the United States can't do it alone. How else are we going to deal with recovery from uh, the economic ravages of the pandemic and the indebtedness of third world nations? United States and India can't do it alone, nor can the IMF and the IBRD. It takes a broader, it takes China to be part of that. How else are we going to deal with COVID and pandemics uh, if there isn't, or if there aren't, there isn't effective cooperation? So I come back to guardrails, and I am really troubled right now, in closing, to make this remark that the other day Xi Jinping stood up before his two congresses. And for the first time in my lifetime, he identified the United States by name as a hostile power designed to do ill to China. Now, let me underscore what a dramatic event that is and how terribly dangerous it is. So guardrails commence with lowering the rhetoric and the sense of hostility at building some confidence that the interaction between the United States, the United States and India, the United States and Quad, is about maintaining balance, not displacing, containing, or rolling back China. And that takes a very different political dialogue one very difficult to put forward in this country, given the royal state of Republican and Democratic treatment of, of the China issue. But you ask the core question of what guardrails have to be about, it's the reestablishment of trust and confidence in the outcomes that we are seeking. So that China looks at making peace in the Gulf, not as an anti-American move, but as a peace-enhancing move, that Chinese intervention in Ukraine is not about concurring advantage to our disadvantage, but part of a global responsibility. So there's a lot to be done. We live in dangerous times. I'm glad I'm sharing them with India. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well said. I think you make the point that you cannot build the guardrails without good diplomacy, consistent diplomacy, sensible diplomacy. But there's another aspect of guardrails which both of you alluded to, which is building up a structural balance of power that enables that diplomacy to be effective. And all the institutions that both of you identified really go to that effort of building up a structural balance of power. Ambassador Wisner, you made an additional point, which is we feel a lot more comfortable working with India for various reasons. And because we see that as an intrinsic part of this desirable balance of power. I want to ask you a question direct, both of you a question directly. Can we sustain that partnership with India purely on the basis of what one might crudely call American benevolence towards India? Or should we be also looking to India for some forms of reciprocity as part of that common venture? I say this because 20 years ago when we were starting out, it was very, when the relationship was still uh, immature and developing, it was very easy for us to talk about building a relationship with India that was centered or structured on magnanimity or altruism. Today, given the changes in our own country, can any relationship with another aspiring great power be sustained entirely on the basis of the United States doing things for that country? Or should we also be looking for what India can do for us, in a sense, make this a genuine joint venture, as opposed to simply 
an American-sponsored plan of building up Indian power to build up that balance of power. If I can take a first crack at that. Uh, the word partnership means that there's give and take on both sides. Uh, and I think those are the best types of partnerships. It doesn't mean that it's a tit for tat, or you, know, you do this, I'll do that. But it's got to be a two-way relationship. And I think Ashley raises a good point that uh, everyone on this stage believes that a strong India is in the interests of the United States. But it's got to be a strong India that we also feel is compatible with things that are important to the United States. So without necessarily stating what the reciprocity is, I very much agree with the broader point that we need to in our candid discussions with the Indians, whether it's in defense planning or the economic relationship or other elements uh, of our interaction, indicate what's important to us and what our expectations are of countries that we might share our most sensitive technology with. And we've done some of this, Ashley referred to earlier, the next steps in strategic partnership. Uh, when that process began, India wanted to get its companies off what was known as the entities list of the Department of Commerce and get greater access to U.S. technology. But the U.S. government was concerned that we need to know where that technology ends up, how it's used, that it doesn't get diverted to the wrong party or get misused even by the party that it goes to. And that requires a very sophisticated export control system that the receiving country has and its willingness to allow what might be called end use visits, a series of uh, requirements that go along with transferring U.S. technology. Well, this was not something that the Indians were very keen on doing. In fact, they felt that was a insult and that it was uh, not respecting their own internal autonomy and how could the United States demand that its companies keep track of items in certain ways. And we actually created a, a roadmap or a glide path of saying, look, if you are able to do this, you can get access to that. I, I would say to my Indian counterparts, you hold the key to the, uh, unlocking the door of getting technology. And it was not a simple process, uh, and it took a lot of time, but we got there and it built up trust and confidence and then led to the civil nuclear deal. And today, India is proud to say that it's a member of the Vasnar arrangement on dual use items, the Australia group on chemical and biological weapons and the missile technology control regime. And it would love to say it's a member of the nuclear suppliers group, the fourth of the multilateral export control regimes, but China has uh, blocked their passage into that. So it's not as if one cannot request reciprocity, but I also think we have to be upfront and candid. You know, one of the things that has evolved in the relationship is our ability to talk frankly with each other and to uh, uh, state where we have areas of disagreement, but it should also be stating where we have expectations and be expecting the partner to come through with that. So I think that is an evolution and an important one in the relationship and one that will only strengthen the partnership over time. Ken, thank you, because you have touched on many thoughts that I would have liked to have come up with, and you've done it much better. Uh, but let me make uh, two observations. Um, first, Ashley, you point to the need for guardrails. I'm going to repeat myself when I say the search for guardrails begins in earnest when you have a common conception of what you're trying to guard. That if we can come to terms with India and we can come to terms with ourselves, that we seek a balance of power in the region and that our purposes are to engage, not to alienate China, but to manage our competition with China, if we can come to terms on those, then the guardrails begin to flow 
and they are e much more easily identifiable and certainly sustainable. And so I have to tell you today that I am skeptical that we have had that conversation with India and reached that degree of consensus. Um, yes, guardrails. Uh, Joe Biden in Bali talked about guardrails. Guardrails have become common nomenclature in Washington. Um, they are really important. They mean, with respect to China, how do you stay out of conflicts in the South China Sea? How do you avoid conflicts in the Himalayas? How do you avoid conflicts in the Senkaku Islands? Uh, how do you alert one another to impending uh, crises when drones or ships uh, bump into one another? How do you crisis manage? Um, but then guardrails need to go beyond that. How do you respond to international security problems? I, for example, believe very deeply that we are much better off for China having helped Iran and Saudi Arabia broker an agreement that we could never have brokered ourselves given the absence of a relationship with Iran. At the same time, I'm deeply troubled that China is doing that with a hostility toward, based on a hostile view of its relationship with the United States. Instead of seeing it, and here's the guardrail, as part of mutual obligations to the maintenance of global security. So I feel guardrails flow from not only common definitions, but trust, and trust we have amply, which leads me to one last observation. We would all be wrong if we overlooked the fact that the Indian-American relationship began in this country heavily influenced by respect Americans had for the principles of Indian democracy. Uh, even when India seemed to fall short in economics, occasionally slipped into an overly close embrace during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, all of these, when some measure in the American mind were offset by India's democracy and India's respect for the core principles that we like to think we aspire to, um, that aspect of the relationship must not be overlooked. Uh, any more than we at home can overlook the real challenges to our own democracy and I underscore real and worrying, but nor can we overlook in our dialogue with India uh, the challenges to India's democracy and the evidences of rising illiberalism in Indian government policy towards minorities is an issue of real concern in this country. It undermines that old spiritual tie that we used to have. Now, does that mean that Ned Price has got to stand up on the podium and lecture India? For God's sakes, uh, glass houses, it can ill afford the throwing of stones. Um, so that's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about those candid and quiet conversations about the need to maintain consensus in our Congress in support of a growing relationship with India within the American media and intellectual communities and vice versa. Uh, we cannot overlook this dimension of India in our life or have India's overlook our problems. But we need to be frank about it and talk about it. Um, it's part of a rather less visible guardrail in the U.S.-India relationship. Ashley, sorry. No, no, Can I just add you? one uh, yes, point to, again, uh, the uh, excellent comments that Frank has made? The Quad is an effort to try to create this balance, in my view, and they're very careful, and it was reiterated again at this uh, panel discussion following their last ministerial of the ministers, that 
the Quad wants to be four things. It wants to be a positive agenda. It wants to be an open architecture. It ultimately could conceptualize a China if it plays by uh, the types of rules that they're talking about in the Quad being part of that process. It is not designed to be against something or a negative, but really creating for the region uh, positive uh, elements of common good, whether it goes to vaccine distributions, whether it goes to cybersecurity, to infrastructure, which is an issue that they are focusing on. It's not that easy to coordinate the different agencies that countries have that work with their private sectors to promote infrastructure, but uh, it's a serious effort made to uh, allow countries to develop infrastructure without having to suffer uh, debt burdens that are simply unsustainable. But the Quad, at least in rhetoric, I can't tell you what goes on in the private meetings that they have among the ministers, but it is not designed and they do not mention China and it is really meant to provide the type of balance that will prevent an expansionist or hegemonic country dominating the region, but will create an architecture that, more than anything, they would like to see the ASEAN and other smaller countries in the region be part of and participate in. So that really is, in some ways, this unique grouping that is trying to grapple with some of the strategic challenges that Frank has so uh, nicely stated that we face going forward. I don't want to belabor the point about the challenges to liberalism, both in India and the United States. Because from where I sit in Washington, I get the full blast uh, of concerns, particularly on Capitol Hill. And I always have a, a mental test at the back of my mind, which is if we were to propose a civil nuclear agreement with India today, would we be able to pass the congressional test in the current environment. And I would be lying if I said we could. So this is an issue that I think we will continue to grapple with, looking for the best way to manage this because of our friendly relations with Delhi. I want to end the public part of this conversation, though, on a different question. And I am going to bring the audience in in a few minutes, I promise. And that is something that you said, Ken, at the beginning, which is India's theory of the case about China's rise hinges on the belief that the United States made China the great power that it is. And it's a theory of the case that is entirely framed in terms of state action and state action on the part of the United States. I am often at pains to tell my Indian interlocutors that while the state played a permissive role, markets were just as critical and perhaps even more critical. Now, both of you have seen the US-India economic relationship at different phases during the times that you served. What do you think we need to do still with respect to making markets the center place of building Indian power. And I connect this to everything, of course, that Arvin does in his academic work, which is to push for a greater freedom in the Indian economy within its own domestic market, greater linkages with the rest of the world, and so on and so forth. And yet, now with the rise of industrial policy, now with the rise in the United States of having two political parties, both who end up being anti-trade. You know, how do we make the argument that at the end of the day, markets are really the solution to the rise of great powers and not just simply uh, expectations of state action? Well, that's it's an excellent question and it's a real dilemma in today's environment. Uh, just to step back, uh, U.S.-India trade has steadily risen over the last 20 plus years, but given the fact that the United States is the world's largest economy and India is the world's fifth largest economy, it's not close to what its potential should be. And part of that is that, in my view, the Indian market has not always been as open and as easy to operate in as one would like. 
and I completely agree with what Ashley said, is that uh, that was the key that China, to China's rise, is it opened its markets, it invited investment, and it flourished in doing so. And if you look at a number of the countries in Asia that have done well, it's been through international trade over time. But what's happened is coming out of COVID-19, where a lot of countries said we have to not be as dependent on others for critical supplies, uh, coming out of the Russian war with Ukraine, where countries are saying we need to be more insulated from the disruptions that can arise from economic sanctions or other elements. It's reinforced, and, and also, quite frankly, that trade has sometimes downsides. Uh, it does create dislocations in local economies. People do uh, lose their jobs, and few countries have done a good job of providing transition relief and, and integrating people into new positions. It's not that easy to do. There's also been technological changes that have put people out of work that sometimes trade is blamed for when trade was not the culprit. But at the end of the day, trade, in my opinion, is essential for economic growth. And right now you have a situation in India, and then I'll go to the United States, where uh, the view is that they want to attract foreign investment to help build their domestic manufacturing base and grow their economy, but they want to do it in a way that they become self-sufficient and self-reliant. And really, while they've done some bilateral trade agreements to take advantage of selected areas of interest to them, they've lowered their barriers to investment while they've raised their barriers to trade. And they freely say that if we make something here, we don't want, we want to make it more difficult to import and we'll only import things that we truly don't have uh, in, in this country. Now, unfortunately, at the same time, the United States, as Ashley was saying, has regarded trade as a negative word. Uh, traditionally, the Republicans were more uh, pro-trade than the Democrats, but they were usually able to cobble together some bipartisan uh, consensus on trade agreements. But that has uh, disappeared. I, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but you saw in the 2016 campaign, even after uh, Secretary Clinton had been a pioneer for the trans Partnership Agreement, the country was viewing trade negatively, and she then sort of stepped a bit away from it. And then Trump won, and he won on an agenda of getting out of these trade agreements. And as I said, abruptly withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which strategically put China in the best position regionally and economically than anyone could do. So if you were concerned about China's influence, withdrawing was strategically incorrect, regardless of the economic aspects to it. But we've now, both parties seem to view trade in a negative way. As I said, we've launched an Indo-Pacific economic framework we have a trade pillar, but the trade pillar doesn't include market access, which is the great sweetener for everyone to have uh, trade agreements. Uh, and we now have, with the CHIPS Act and with the Inflation Reduction Act, really a resurrection of industrial policy. Maybe in some areas you could say it's important, maybe in semiconductors, but we're now doing it across the board. We have the Europeans upset at us that uh, on green technology and elect electric vehicles, we're being uh, protectionist. And so this is, uh, for I think the three of us on this stage and many uh, others, a mistake in terms of what it's going to have as an impact on your economy over time. Often what happens, unfortunately, in the policy world is the pendulum swings one way, things aren't good, people overreact and it swings too far the other way. And there were legitimate concerns about how trade uh, had dislocated people who were not reintegrated into the economy. There were concerns about some of these critical dependencies, but the answer is not to shut out trade, it's to adjust the way you have some trade agreements to maybe exclude some things. And we haven't gotten back to that middle equilibrium. We were sort of on the uh, negative side. And I think, unfortunately, in both India and the United States, uh, this does not bode well for their economic integration. And again, 
it just gives the advantage to, if you're concerned about the hegemonic or expansionist role of China, to their ability to make other countries depend on their relationship with the Chinese. And I'm not saying it's bad for China to have strong trade relations, but it's important for India, the United States, and other countries to have equally strong trade relationships, so there is this balance. Thank you. I want to open the floor uh, to questions. Can, can I just quickly comment on that? Yes, please. Uh, I, I, will, Very I will admit to you all, just raise your hands, introduce yourself, and then ask the question. Frank, go ahead. I just wanted to uh, warn everyone that Ken and I are about to have a violent agreement <laughs> on the subject of American trade policy and the issue of a pendulum that swings in American public life much too far too often before finding some balance point in the middle. And yes, we need a trade component to foreign policy, particularly in managing our relations in the Pacific and on the global stage. But so does India. And we make, uh, we, we're wrong to overlook how deeply entrenched in India is our reservations about open, competitive, market accessible economies. Um, I'm not going to pretend I can answer this question, but I do know that right from the beginning of the Indian Republic, uh, the idea that India would make her own way in the world and not be subjected to the attractions of foreign capital uh, is embedded in the intellectual structure. But around that, around that, around the view that state enterprises will drive the growth of India and that the protection of the Indian economy is a vital component of state power, uh, has grown barnacles, very infested, numbers of barnacles from the private sector, all of whom have specialized interests in aspects of the controlled trade environment. And then you can layer politics on top of it, small traders in their fear of displacement inside the majority party in the BJP. Put it all together, it's a bad stew for trade liberalization. But it's one that we have to acknowledge. For I agree totally with Ken that to see a real burst in American Indian economic cooperation, it has got to be private sector driven. It's got to be under the view that both of us are going to have economies that allow for competition. Yeah. And Ken's made the case for the U.S. going down that road. I'm going to make one for India. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So, go ahead. Yeah, so I want to take off exactly here. Both the last two interventions, absolutely fantastic on both sides. Um, now, you know, we talked about reciprocity, you raised Ashley and, and, and Kent made some very good remarks. I think this is where actually some pressure from the United States on Indian liberalization would have been very useful. But it's right now missing. I think you know, the traditional approach of the US has been precisely insisting on reciprocity that you know, I will liberalize mine but you have to do your part. And that is kind of missing because U.S. doesn't want to liberalize. It seems to me that in the longer run, or even shorter than maybe medium run, really the real vehicle for, for India and the United States to come together, especially in this Asian context, really is to be for both of them to be in the TPP, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's a sort of pity that the United States kind of has pulled out of it. Um, and, and, you know, China is making its application. Now, the, the problem is that if, if China does, in fact, actually enter the TPP before either the US or India enter, um, then I think that partnership, basically, that route closes. And this is where I, it seems to me that, and I, I think they're a bit far off, it's, it, although they have applied, I, I, or they're in the process of application, it's not about to happen. But, but it seems to me that that's a natural place for both India and the United States to come together. 
I mean, this goes together with geopolitics, it goes together with economic interests, it goes together with both, you know, I mean, I agree that decoupling is not going to happen, but to the extent that they, any decoupling can be done, I think that partnership really, you know, is, is, is where it, it, it can happen. So if we can get some it, it, reactions. You know, for the first six to 12 months after I came back as ambassador, I was saying that repeatedly. And I kept being told, it's a non-starter. It's not gonna happen. Uh, part of it is politics. Uh, no one now, for whatever reason, wants to be associated with the initials TPP. So the idea was maybe if we launch some other agreement, uh, and in some sense, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework was an effort to do that, but it's not a trade arrangement. We'll see what happens. But I couldn't agree with you more. It's a high standards agreement, which makes it challenging for India to come into it. You'd have to give them a long period of time to uh, meet those standards. It wouldn't happen overnight. But it is something that uh, I've written about and I think makes a lot of sense. But political reality at this point seems to prevent that. Now, China does not meet the standards of the CPTPP. But the concern is if they keep knocking at the door and the United States and India are nowhere to be seen, eventually they'll get in on certain representations, promises, projections, because the other countries will feel there's no alternative but to letting them in. And then uh, that changes the nature of what the CPTPP is. One last point on the reciprocity. This actually did occur in the last administration. There is a program called the Generalized System of Preferences, which allows participating countries, and India was one, to have enormous number of products come into our country duty-free, well over a thousand. But there is a requirement that says the beneficiary country has to increasingly open its own market. And we had several sectors that said the Indian market is not opening, the dairy sector, the medical device sector, and eventually the IT sector. And so when the US Trade Representatives did a study of this, they determined that India is in violation, but we tried to negotiate what we called the mini agreement, which would say, allow us to get some medical devices and some uh, other IT products, and then we will not take G GSP away. We could not reach it. We got close. It could not get done. It was a great frustration of mine. We then revoked GSP, which created a big uh, outrage in India. Uh, now one of the things that could help resurrect a trade deal would be to grant India GSP again in conjunction with greater access for U.S. goods. But the Congress has not reauthorized the generalized system of preferences, so that's currently off the table. So there's a mixture of the domestic politics of international posturing of other things, but it's all to the loss, I think, of the economic relationship that, as I said, doesn't fulfill its potential given the size of our economies. And also America's role in the world, right, which is the larger, America's role in the world, especially as a leader of trade. Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick uh, one sentence that to Frank's point, I think the attitude in Delhi is changing. And, and the two agreements with Australia and UAE are, are a sign of that. Uh, uh, there's no question now that the Prime Minister certainly sees the importance of geopolitics and, and how you know, he has to con in with this. This post-Galwan politics in India has changed. And, and there is much greater uh, uh, appetite now to, at least through free trade agreements, move ahead. Uh, we didn't get to discuss too much about the India-Russia relationship historically and how you see that might be evolving. And I have in mind at least three complications, and there are probably many more uh, to think about, but the first being marriage of convenience between Russia and China going on right now. The affinity, of course, evolving between India and the US. We've discussed that quite a bit today. Uh, and then one that's less discussed, but that uh, there is, uh, and I don't have the exact number, but probably about 60 or so percent of India's defense armaments, maintenance supplies, training, uh, relevant training, uh, still connected for many more years to come, if not decades, uh, with long-range agreements and the industrial infrastructure machinery set up still being dependent on Russia. So just 
would curious to know your thoughts, how we should see this relationship evolving with, within these three dynamics. Thank you. Are there any other, are there any interventions on this question? Because I want to take one or two questions at a time. I'll just piggyback on the previous question, uh, adding to that also energy security uh, and the dependence on Russia for um, nuclear energy and, um, you know, the agreements that we have in terms of developing new nuclear plants with them. So uh, how do we see nuclear um, energy security shaping up with uh, our dependence on Russia for that as well? Take it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, clearly this is a complicated issue in the U.S.-India relationship, uh, and it is a complicated issue for India in terms of its relationship with Russia. As you mentioned, India right now faces 50,000, 60,000 Chinese troops on its northern border with equipment that is largely Russian and feels it is dependent on spare parts from Russia for that. Also, despite the fact that Russia and China had a announcement on February 4th of last year about their partnership without limits, India still hopes to keep some daylight between the two countries and uh, would like to believe that if Russia, China ever had a conflict with India on the northern border, Russia would be on the sidelines. And it hopes over time to have a strengthened relationship with Russia as an independent pole in a multipolar world. Uh, that said, and that's why, by the way, India has not publicly condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and that's been troubling to uh, people who believe the principles of territorial integrity, sovereignty, and peaceful resolution of disputes should be important to any country that wants to be a leading power in the world. On the other hand, if you look at India's behavior over time, uh, while it has abstained on UN resolutions, the statements that have gone along with that have been increasingly implicitly critical of Russia, and in the Quad statement that came out of their ministerial a few weeks ago, for the first time they actually, all four countries put in there uh, that there's a need to respect territorial integrity, sovereignty, peaceful resolution disputes, and the like. My own view is India recognizes that Russia is a declining power and is over time probably not going to be able to provide the spare parts it needs or the technology for other sophisticated weaponry uh, and that it is rapidly trying to diversify away from that need but it has a short-term uh, problem. It also, as long as the rest of the world is buying Russian energy, I think India says why should we be uh, prevented from doing so. So I see India myself moving away from Russia uh, implicitly, but I don't think they will do it explicitly given the historical relationship and what it feels it has at stake uh, with it. I'll take one last question before we... Oh, the question, the energy. Energy security, again, I, as I said, I think if you listen to India's Minister of External Affairs, Jay Shankar, he will say we need to balance our national interests with our principles and their national interest is that they need to get low-priced energy to keep their economy going, to deal with some of their challenges in terms of poverty and whatever. And as I said, I think the West is weakened in its principle against doing so when European countries and others are still purchasing that energy and we're even buying pro uh, products that India processes from Russian energy in the West. So sort of a dilemma, but I don't think it's fair to isolate India in that issue. Let me just add a quick note to that question, uh, to Ken's excellent answers. Um, I, I personally believe that energy is one of the terrific opportunities in the India-American relationship, and that it bears a lot of attention. I guess I learned that the hard way, Ashley, over the nuclear agreement. Uh, while the American-Indian cooperation is lagged in that particular field, uh, gas is absolutely soared to the fore. And there are all the new technologies, uh, the hydrogens and the winds and energies. I, I believe it's not only a huge 
U.S.-India area of priority, interest, and promise, and part of the reciprocal side of the trade issue that Arvind has correctly put his finger on, but I also believe that it has quad potential to offer the world energy solutions on behalf of cooperating powers that the world so badly needs. One last round of questions because I know we have, you've got to go. Can I take just one question? Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, from us, I guess. So one last question, please. Thank you. So Board. thank you for such an interesting discussion. Um, coming back to the economic relationship, uh, Professor Panagria just talked about coming together in the Asian context. And with CPP definitely off the table in Washington, we're looking at the IPEF. And I'm wondering if you might comment on whether you think anything useful will come from IPEF um, and whether it, it really builds in this idea that you have stressed about the fact that the relationship will have to be built by the private sector. India is already out of the trade pillar. Um, a lot of the other pillars look very government driven um, if they're driving anything. So I just wonder, could you um, just briefly comment on, do you have any optimism or hope coming out of IPEF? Very quickly, the IPEF is, is an initiative launched by the United States, but it has 14 countries that are involved in it. There are four pillars, trade is one, another one is tax and anti-corruption, another one is climate issues, and the fourth one I think is uh, either supply, cha uh, supply chains. And they are having intensive discussions. It's unclear what the product will be. It will not be a traditional type of treaty or agreement. Maybe it'll be a statement of principles uh, or something of the like. But there is a very uh, important initiative between the United States and India that recently was launched, which is the Initiative on Critical and Emerging Technologies. It was launched in January, and under the auspices of the two national security advisors, which again is important because it shows that there's a political impetus behind it, there's a broad agenda of ways we can work together, whether it's in semiconductors, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and the like. The important thing, in my opinion, is that there's no shortage of good ideas. We have to pick a few that we actually focus on and implement. Uh, it's easy to generate ideas. It's tougher to get them through the system. And we've got to do it in a way, this gets back to Ashley's question, where there are reciprocal obligations on each party to make it work. It's not simply a way of India receiving American technology. <laughs> there's going to be requirements that go along with that. But my own advice would be it's great uh, conceptually. It's excellent that there can be working groups pursuing all these areas, but if I were the ambassador now or the assistant secretary of state, I'd say, okay, what are the two or three ones that we really think we have a realistic chance of doing something on? Let's focus on them and work out a roadmap to get them done. Well, hallelujah. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. I want to just, on behalf of all of you, uh, thank Ambassador Visna and Ambassador Jester for a really wonderful conversation. I'm sure we could have gone on easily for another half hour of time permitted. But thank you and all the best to both of you and all the best for the rest of the time.